So I'm going to open it up in prayer. Father God, I just uh, ask that you put your mighty hand upon this uh, webinar, and I pray, Lord, that you'd guide and direct all of us. Um, help us to learn to uh, develop and implement a budget and manage money according to your principles and your will. And Father, I just pray you'd be with us. Um, just I uh, pray we'd have good answers again and, and questions like we had last time. And I also pray that um, the breakout rooms and everything would go well and, and the technology would go well. Father, bless us, guide and direct us, and give us your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's the objective of this session, to understand God's uh, admonition to plan ahead, uh, Luke 14, 28 to 30. And planning your finances can be best accomplished by developing and impl implementing a budget. And um, if you don't like the word budget, call it a spending plan or a cash flow plan. That they're basically the same thing. Um, and the purpose of budgeting is to ensure you spend less than you're earning out. You have a surplus to pay down debt and, and save for future needs. So um, uh, that's really what we're trying to do. I'm trying to help you get a positive monthly cash flow. Most people in this country and around the world do not manage their monthly cash flow well. They inadvertently, unintentionally spend a little more than they make. And instead of accumulating and saving for retirement or kids' education or down payment on a house, they, 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 they accumulate debt is what they do. That's the most common thing that, that happens in our country and around the world. So here's a few questions. I'll open it up in a minute. Um, so here's a couple of questions. I'll throw it out. Um, what do these scriptures say to you? By wisdom a house is built, through understanding it is established, through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures, Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. So what, do, what does that say to you? What would you say that scripture says? What do you, how does that apply to managing finances? What do you think? Okay, some good, some good answers coming through here. Um, God gives us wisdom to know how to use what, what he's given to us, absolutely, especially if you get into his word. Most of the wisdom is in his word. It's a process. You need to invest the time to learn about finances, absolutely. Good answer, Rebecca, specifically what God says. We have to apply what God has instructed us to do through the Bible, absolutely. Um, when you do a budget, you... Have a clearer picture of your spending habits and where your money's going. And actually, that alludes to the next scripture down here. Proverbs 27, 23. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, you need to know where your money's going. Most people don't know where their money's going. Um, you need to ask God for wisdom. Absolutely, James 1, 5. Um, wise money management. Encourage us to ask for wisdom, uh, to know what to do. Yep. Um, need to have the facts of your cash situation before you. I call them your financial facts, absolutely. Most people do not. So often I, I found over the years when I meet with an individual or, or a couple, it doesn't matter who it is, and they've accumulated a lot of debt, they have no idea where their money's been going over the past several years. You need to put the principles into practice. Yeah, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Um, we are stewards and a budget helps us to spend and invest wisely. That's true. Wisdom is like the person building their house on the rock and not on sand. Yeah, I think that's in um, Matthew chapter 7, a very good, uh, good example. Uh, pay attention to what you're doing and uh, what you're given. Absolutely seek wisdom from God prior to building your house. A wise person builds a firm foundation with their home, finances, and other areas. Absolutely. And I think the key way to build that firm foundation is doing things God's way, learning and applying the biblical financial principles, and then when there's several options within the biblical guidelines, take the time to pray and discern and ask God to speak to you through his word, through his spirit. He can speak to your heart. He can speak to your mind. He can give you a peace or a lack of peace before you make a major financial decision. So those are really excellent answers. Um, I, I appreciate um, all, those, all those answers. You need to have, you've know, you got you to gotta build some resources. It's, um, it's actually biblical to have some savings. We talked about that before. In the house of the wise, is, there's a storage of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. So, um, so God admonishes us, this is my summary, to have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. How can we accomplish this in a practical fashion? We must do the essentials of budgeting. Include track your expenses. That's on form number six, which I'll go to in a minute on the Copeland budgeting system. So you know where your money's going. And develop and implement a budget to ensure you're spending less than you earn and have a surplus to pay down debt. That'll show up on form number five. Um, and a proper budgeting system, it will provide the financial facts in order to make wise decisions, guesswork, um, decisions, um, and, and decisions based on personal desires are very dangerous. Most people make decisions based on their personal desires and they just make quick, hasty, um, hasty decisions and it's very dangerous. 
In the parable of the tower, Luke 14, 28 to 30, Christ admonished us to plan ahead. Now let's see what Jesus had to say here, especially as it applies to finances. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Now you may not want to build a tower, but you may, um, if you're a young person, you may want to save to buy a car. You may want to save a down payment for a home. Um, as a single person, you may want to save some money for retirement, save some money for your kid's education. May, you may want to save some money in order to pay down your debts and, and become debt free. But so Christ is saying, suppose you want to do something, whatever it is, the tower is just an example. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost of, to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Christ is saying we need to plan ahead, and if we don't plan ahead, we're foolish. Most people in this country and around the world are actually foolish. They fly by the seat of their pants. They buy things that they want, not necessarily what they need. They don't have any type of controls on their finances in terms of tracking their expenses and making sure that they don't spend more than they make. They just um, do what they want, and the credit's available there, and you can have a great time and enjoy all kinds of material things and go on holidays for a long time on credit, but eventually it catches up to you and you're going to have, you're going to have problems. Um, this is another key verse, Proverbs 21.5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. The idea of planning and diligence. Some versions say the plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage as surely as haste leads to poverty. Hasty decisions, like when someone goes to a shopping mall and they make, they make quick decisions, or it could be a guy going to a a car dealership and you know not really intending to buy a vehicle but he starts looking at someone and the salesman gets talking and he drives one and next thing you know he's got a forty thousand dollar loan um it's it's you know it's it's very easy to do to make uh, quick hasty uh impulse buy decisions and that they're actually quite dangerous notice it says as surely as haste that's the impulse decisions the scripture is talking about as surely as him impulse decisions lead lead to poverty so um, I'm going to go through the recommended memory verse in a minute. Actually, let's do it right now, and then I'll deal with the questions. So let's read this uh, scripture together. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Okay, so that's, I know it's a bit longer than some, but, uh, you know, it's amazing if you start meditating on God's Word, you meditate on this for a couple of weeks, and I think you'll have it memorized. And the big picture concept is really simple. Christ is saying, plan ahead. I mean, you, know, you, you forget everything else, he's just, he's admonishing us to plan ahead. That's what he's doing here. I, I did an in-depth study back in uh, the mid-1980s, what the Bible said on planning, and I came up with about 40 verses that referred to planning, and each time, it, it, it was an admonition. I mean, another one here is Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to, to poverty. So planning, uh, especially planning your finances, is really important. Now, we got lots of people out there called financial planners and, and financial advisors. What they're trying to do is get you to invest money in RESPs, kids' education plan, you know, edu registered education savings plan and your retirement plan, that kind of stuff. And that's good stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. But what I find... A lot of them aren't teaching people how to manage their monthly cash flow because if, you, if they don't manage their monthly cash flow well, then they're, they're not going to ever be able to put money aside for retirement and for kids' education because even if they do put some aside, they start running up credit card debt, eventually they're going to have to draw down their retirement plan and, and, and pay off the debt so, um, and even draw it from an RSP. So uh, let me just see some of the, the comments here. Not paying cash. Yeah, it's easy to overspend uh, when we buy with credit cards. Absolutely. It's, um, and certainly one thing I say to people, if you've got a history of uh, overspending with the credit cards, cut them up. Just use a debit card. Just use a debit card. If you don't have the money in the bank, you can't spend it. Um, so, um, you know, now there's nothing wrong with having a credit card as long as you use it wisely to buy wants, to, sorry, to buy needs, not wants and desires, and you pay it off each month. Okay, so here's, a, here's where we get into some interesting questions. And I should mention here that the, um, let, let, me, let me get into some questions. Can you think of some financial challenges that a single person will likely encounter 
compared to a married person. So what are some of the financial challenges a single person would likely encounter? Okay, not paying cash. Okay, single person has more disposable income. Actually, I thought people would be saying the opposite. A single person would have less disposable income because they uh, only got one income instead of two. You don't have to have a second income. You don't have to, but I can tell you uh, from counseling thousands of people, if there's two incomes, it's easier to balance the budget because a lot of the expenses, like if it's rent of an apartment or even if you own a house with mortgage and repairs and maintenance, utilities, a lot of the expenses, what we call fixed expenses, is, and, um, and you know, if you have two people in a house instead of one, um, you know, the, 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 mortgage, the, the mortgage doesn't increase. You know, the, a lot of your fixed expenses stay the same. Less household income, yep. During times of a job loss, there's no one to pick up the slack. That's true, good, good point. Single income, pay for everything, yep. No one else to answer to, okay. Single people have to cover all the monthly expenses, yeah, it, it, it makes it tougher. Um, being invited to stand in multiple friends and family members, okay, okay. Okay, okay, so going to, to a lot of events on your own, and plus you gotta fund the gift on your own as well. Challenge impulse buying of pick big ticket items. Doesn't have to discuss it with anymore, can just buy. Okay, that's, that's a good point, Alexandra. The, um, if someone is not a good money manager and they tend to buy things they don't need with money they don't have, i.e. they do it on credit, and if they don't have a spouse that can help uh, restrain them, then that, that puts them at a disadvantage. Uh, that's true. Not having accountability, that's true. Um, always having to pay double occupancy when staying at a hotel, that's true, good point. It's hard to buy groceries and prepare good meals for a single person, yeah, okay. No second income, making decisions by yourself. Easier to control the spending in some way. So, I mean, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but there are some advantages to being single. In general, single person have less income. None to challenge your thinking, which can be a downside, it can be upside if the other person's a bad money manager. Feeling there's less responsibility, okay. Um, some single people spend differently than others, just like not all married spend the same, and that's, that's true. People definitely spend more, so thanks for those comments. Here, here's what I had, just a few of them. I, I, what I've seen over the years, difficulty balancing their budget because they have one income instead of two. It's, it's, a, it's a lot easier um, I'm assuming that everyone or almost everyone on this call is single or single again. And just think, if you had your income and you had a spouse that had the same income as you or perhaps a bit more, it's going to be a lot easier to balance your budget. A single person does not have a spouse with whom they can discuss finances. However, they could speak to a Christian friend or financial advisor who understands God's word on finances. So one of, one of the challenges of a single person, they, they don't have someone they can talk to about on their finances. Also, this is one, obtaining a mortgage to buy a house or even renting a place um, can be more challenging. You want to buy a house today, I mean, and I'm in the greater Toronto area and, and out, right throughout this country, Canada, and most of the states and a lot of places in the world, the price of real estate has gone just crazy in terms of on the upward side in price. And, um, and, and often, uh, most people to buy a house, they need two incomes, uh, unless the one income this is one income earner, and, and it's not that a single person can't buy their own place. It's just it, it's going to be harder if you only got one income, and especially with the prices today. So let me just go to some of the uh, comments here before I talk about shared accommodation. Yeah, there can be less responsibility if you're single. Um, and so if you, if you have a bad habit of spending when you shouldn't, you don't have, but you can get an accountability partner. Uh, it doesn't have to be your spouse. Yeah, when you have more people... Um, you can you get better better opportunity of buying in bulk. That's true. That's true. Okay. Any other uh, questions so far before I talk about shared accommodation? Okay. So I'm going to throw something out to you here. By the way, this is not in my book. You will get the PowerPoint slides. Um, I actually um, started to really deal with this when I was speaking at Life 100.3 Radio about a year and a half ago, and someone called in and said she, she was single, and said, what about shared accommodation? Do you recommend that? Well, off the top of my head, I could certainly see some advantages to it. I could also see some challenges, and you're going to see in a, rec a minute, I'm going to suggest some um, recommendation of some steps you should take before you uh, enter into shared accommodation, but it can have some significant benefits. 
if you end up sharing accommodation with the right person. Um, so for, for single people, accommodation, uh, it can enable them to balance their budget. I mean, you go rent an apartment um, and it's, say, a couple grand a month. Uh, say it's a two-bedroom apartment, it's going to be 2000 a month, whether it's just you there or if you share it with someone. If you share it with someone, you can cut your rent in half. So, and, and same with, there's just other ways, there are some advantages. But more specifically, what do you think would be the advantages of shared accommodation? What do you think? Give me, give me some comments of the advantages of shared, shared accommodation. Yeah, how to buy a home with single. I mean, I, in other words, the implication is if, 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 you, if you have a, someone to, to buy the home with, I, I've, seen, I've seen two women to go together. I've seen two men go together. Um, you know, just uh, that they're just friends. Um, I'm not talking about a same-sex relationship. I'm talking about friends that they say, hey, I can't afford a house. You can't afford a house on your own. Why don't we do it together? I think of two sisters that bought a house together. And, and they're, um, it's worked out extremely well for them. Um, neither one of them could have, could have afforded a house. Yeah, you only share accommodation, find the right person. Yeah, so I mean, I, I agree. You gotta, we'll talk about that in a minute, Carmen. Uh, share the cost, saves rent, less lonely, that's true. More fun. Fellowship, have a friend to keep you accountable, true. Uh, can put extra cash towards debt down payment, absolutely, if you lower your fixed costs. Perhaps a uh, company and accountability with the right person, absolutely. Save for a future down payment for a house, yep. As long as you get along, that's a practice, yeah, absolutely. The ability to save while you're in the situation, share costs, share household costs. Opens uh, more opportunity, more cash flow, savings, vacation, yep. Need to get along with the person, they need to be responsible for the rent. That's a good point, Paul. We'll talk about that in a minute. And why would I do this if I lived at home before with my family? Just a thought. I mean, if you're living at home with your parents and they're covering the majority of the fixed overhead costs and you're just paying a relatively modest amount for rent, that can be a great opportunity for you to save for a down payment or, or save in order to pay off your debts. Um, I find today that most young people, before they leave their parents' home, they don't take that opportunity, and so often they complete, let's say, post-secondary to start working. They've got a full-time income, and what do they do? They spend it on cars, vacations, designer to clothes, all kinds of stuff, and often they're, they're not saving at a time when it's often sometimes the best opportunity in their life to save. Uh, they're living at home, and they, they, they don't have a lot of fixed overhead costs. Yeah, you can share, that's a good point, B, is shared responsibilities, cleaning, rent, bills, food. Um, you, can, you can share that as well. So the advantages of, of shared accommodation, and, and I find this is, I just make this comment because I find a lot of single people don't consider this when it can be a really good way from a financial perspective, and it's got some of the other advantages too, like we talked about having a friend, uh, an accountability partner maybe, and uh, you know, that, you know there, there can be some really good advantages to it. So here's what I had. Significant reduction of fixed costs, such as rent, utilities, mortgage payments, repairs and maintenance. You probably can cut it in half. Like I say, two single people share an apartment, cost 2000 a month, allows them to reduce their rent to 1000 so it's 50%. There's an opportunity for fellowship. There's an element of safety when two people live together as opposed to being alone. Say, say one of them has a, a significant health issue. Um, the other person can be there, can be there to help along. So um, it's uh, so anyhow. Um, let me just. Um, now I'm going to talk about the challenges in a minute, but let me just see. Yeah, I mean, someone's talking here about a co-op at lower rent with with other Christians. That would, that would be fine. I don't know if there's some out there where they're necessarily believers, but there are a number of co-ops around. So now, how about this question? Um, what do you think would be some of the challenges or disadvantages of shared accommodation? Um, Discord, yep, yep, especially if you get involved with uh, a person that's difficult. Um, I've done my room rental and home and, and Airbnb for years. Now, maybe it's worked for Stephanie. Um, clash of personality, that's true. People can leave uh, due to getting married. That's, that's a very good, good point, or leave the country. I've seen that happen where people uh, rent a place together and, um, and they, don't, they don't discuss that. Really different worldviews, yeah, absolutely. Um, irresponsible, yeah, one could be responsible. Your rent can go up when someone leaves, leaves. absolutely it can. And you gotta, you'll see in a minute, I got some suggestions to deal with some of these. Habits, I mean, the person you live with could have a bad habit that just drives you crazy. Maybe they leave a, 
the tea bag and the dirty dishes in the sink at night and uh, they don't rinse them off and put them in the dishwasher or clean them. Sometimes someone doesn't keep their side of the deal, yep. You're relying on the person pulling their weight financially, absolutely, that's, that's a good one. And uh, if they default on payment, you might, um, oh yeah, you, you, you would be on the hook. Um, people don't do their part of the chores, etc., to help out, yep. Different views on cleanliness, I agree. That can be an issue. I mean, that can be an issue between a husband and wife, too. So um, it's, um, this is a good point. Uh, they may not be good managers of money, and you could end up, um, you could end up with the, the entire bill. So you, you got to be careful about that. That's a good one, Denise. Invasion of privacy. Yeah, you can get that, although you could set out some rules at the beginning. Um, oh, and Tiana comment. it's a good lesson for marriage. It, that's true, to get used to... Uh, just living with another person, and whoever you live with is going to have some quirkers and probably some habits you don't like. Someone have might like lots of other people. That's true. You could get a, 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 a strong introvert living with a strong, a strong introvert living with a strong extrovert. The extrovert wants people over all the time, and the introvert, uh, he or she just wants time to themselves. Uh, yeah, if one of the roommates loses her job, that can be a challenge. Roommate always brings over other people. That's true. I mean, I think of a a young man and actually living downtown Toronto, working downtown Toronto, he's, he's shared an apartment with three other young guys and that's become an issue. One of the young guys has brought in his girlfriend and that's becoming a problem. Um, you might, okay, um, and you, you need to double them, okay. Um, not everyone on the same page, things are different and then originally planned, okay. Living with non-Christians has its challenges, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I did, it, did this and I'm glad I'm on my own. Okay, someone here had a bad experience. People can be self-centered. Um, mitigating, okay. Is this not like co-signing? No, it's not like... Uh, good, that's a good question, okay. When you enter into, a, let's say, a lease, um, or even a mortgage with somebody. Now, the, the mortgage, at least you got collateral on, on the house. You got an asset. But you let her into a rental agreement with a person. You're not... There's a bit of, you could argue there's a bit of co-signing there. You're going to be responsible for your portion. Um, they're going to be responsible for theirs. But if they don't pay, the landlord's going to kick you out. So there, there's a little bit of the co-signing there. And, and remember, um, actually, I just did an in-depth um, analysis of co-signing. I'm going to be doing a half-hour show on that very shortly. You know, co-signing is discouraged in Scripture. It's not a legalism, that's for sure, but it's discouraged. But if you get somebody that's a good money manager and that you can live with, it can, it can really help you save a lot of money and save that down payment for a house, etc. How people deal with conflict, that's a good, good comment. Yep. You have three people renting, it's like co-signing. If one doesn't pay, the others have to chip in. There, there's an element there. There is an element of that. Um, to me, that doesn't in and of itself mean wrong because if you get the right person it can really work helping others taking in international students yep you can take in students uh, she knows a friend and never bought a got married and bought a never got married and bought a place with a friend it, it can work let's put it this way it, it can work so here's what I had as some of the um, the challenges um, if one housemate does not pay their pro rata share of the expenses and you could get stuck with the entire cost that was mentioned and that's that's absolutely true um, sometimes people, even if they are family or friends, cannot live together. Um, perhaps a different lifestyle, different values, different personalities, different likes and dislikes. Some people just can't live together. Um, so question, are there any recommendations? Let's say you're, you're, let's say you're a financial coach, okay? And uh, you're, you're looking and you're trying to help somebody who's single, and they, they don't have a lot of income. And um, maybe they have a child or two, maybe they don't. But let's say they're single and they don't have a lot of income and they're hoping to be able to save up some money and get a down payment on a house one day, but they're never going to be able to do it if they're renting on their own. So what would be some, um, some, some recommendations you'd give them before they agree to share accommodation with anyone? Okay, make sure it's someone you know and well, know well and trust. Absolutely, that's a, that's a key one. Uh, buy a house that you can duplex. In other words, I guess sort of split it up. That's a good idea. If you can afford to buy a house together, uh, try to buy one that you can literally make into a duplex or split it up. Maybe one has the 
main floor and one has the basement or whatever, so you have your own quarters. Be ready to be financially responsible. Know how to pay bills on time, absolutely. Get reference on your roommate, absolutely. You know, get some references. References is good. Know your rental property, rental partner well, absolutely. You need to know the person well. I was able to get a place in BC for $1,000 a month uh, and all doing things God's way, okay. Knowing someone beforehand is, um, is good, like a friend, you should know them well. I agree, you need to know the, know the person well. Buy a house with your parents. Yeah, you can do that. Now that can have its challenges too, but uh, at least with your parents, you generally know their strengths, their weaknesses, their idiosyncrasies, all the challenges. You've lived with them, presumably, for quite a number of years. And then you'll see some things in a minute I'm going to talk about that even if you'd buy a house with your parents or even a brother or sister or whatever, someone you know really well, you've got to agree on some things. I'm going to suggest that in a minute. Uh, make sure you agree on some uh, written house rules, yeah, and also make sure you have a copy of, a, of the lease rental agreement. I agree. Have a daily check to make sure that things are going well. Okay, uh, you know, communicate. Communicate regularly. Having parents buy a house uh, for you to rent is iffy. Uh, I could not do that. It would ruin my relationship with them. So, yeah, I mean, you you got you to gotta pray and ask for God's wisdom and direction before you enter into shared accommodation with anyone, whether they're family or not. Should I accept a down payment from sister, non-believer? I decline. I don't know. If your sister is, is willing to lend you at 0% rate, and as long as the rest of your cash flow flows, I don't think it's wrong if, it's, if you're buying the house on your own. If you're going to buy a house as a partner with her and joint ownership, I'll talk about that later. There's, there, there is some concerns there, some, some scriptures you want to con continue, consider. Uh, controlling parents, not good, okay. Um, outline expenses that would be split. Excellent, Rebecca. That's, you, you need to, one of the key things is develop a budget. Prepare a budget beforehand and decide, um, you know, figure out how much you're going to, how much you're going to need, each person's going to have to put in, and make sure that other person, and then if, if, if there's some expenses, maybe you're going to split the rent, the utilities, that kind of stuff. Maybe you're not, maybe you're going to buy your food independently, and that's fine. So you need to clarify that. Rent to a student on a short term or who is on a short work placement, if it doesn't work, um, at least they will be gone soon. That, that's true. That's, that can be an advantage. Pray first above all. I agree 100%. No substitute for praying and asking God for his wisdom and direction. These are excellent answers. So let me show you what I have. And this is not all inclusive. There's some that you had that I don't have on my list, especially about checking out the references to me. It's, that's implied in one of the comments I make here, but uh, to actually go further. First, develop a budget with respect to the projected cost of the accommodation, including the non-monthly expenses, to see if you and your potential housemate can afford it. Um, so you need to develop, develop a budget. What's all it going to cost? Assess the financial management skills or lack thereof of your potential housemate. If your potential housemate or apartment man, mate, whatever it is, um, if they're a bad money manager, I'd say forget it because you're likely, unless you're prepared to pay the entire rent, I'd say just forget it. All parties need to track their expenses and record regarding the accommodation in private and provide receipts. So, you know, there may be some expenses that one, one person would pay um, you know, everybody needs to track what they've spent on, on the property. Maybe there's a repair or a maintenance and provide receipts so there can be an accounting to make sure everybody's treated fairly. Assess the lifestyle of your potential housemate. Are you compatible? Um, if, if you're talking and thinking of a, sharing accommodation with someone that's got an expensive lifestyle, you know, you, you better think twice. Um, that, that can be dangerous. Also, any impact on your kids. Now, you notice right up until now, I haven't talked about the situation with, uh, some, some here may think, some may think Tom's only talking about two single people sharing a place. Not necessarily. That's, that's simpler, but I have seen cases where two single moms with kids, I saw one where, where one had one kid and, and the other had two, and they shared a place, and, and it worked out quite well. The mother's were compatible and the kids uh, had fun with each other. So it can work out. It definitely can work out, even if there's kids in the picture. Um, now, if, you, if you're a single mom and you got four kids and you got a friend that's got six kids, well, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, 12 people. You're going to have to have a pretty big house. You'd have to literally probably have a house that could be split in two and 
have lots of room to make that work. And, and I, that, that kind of thing can work in the right situation. And I also say impact on your kids. Um, you don't want to share accommodation with someone else that has clearly some secular worldly values that could have a negative impact on your kid. You, you, I, I think you don't want to do that. You'd rather share accommodation as someone that's going to be a good, good example of a godly man or a godly woman, uh, whatever, whatever you have. Um, together develop an emergency fund for unexpected expenditures, just like in your own finances. The, 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 um, the people working together should, should have an emergency fund. As a matter of fact, I'd suggest they open a joint account. They each put in the same amount of money, if that's the agreed amount. And, um, and, and keep a surplus of cash there of 1000 or 2000 bucks for an emergency fund. If you're going to purchase a house together, discuss and agree on things such as saving for future major repairs and maintenance. Um, that's really important. I, I remember a case where um, a, a son and a daughter, um, and they had two kids, um, bought a house together with, with her parents. And they had very different ideas. The parents wanted to renovate everything and make everything look really nice. And the young, the kids, the young, and these were kids like in their early 30s, they didn't have the money. They said, well, we're going to redo the kitchen. It's 40,000 bucks. You've got to kick in 20. Well, we haven't got that kind of dough. Um, so, you know, you've got you to gotta take those things into consideration and, and do all of this before you enter into an agreement. Do it all up front. Discuss up front what happens if one of the single housemates decides to move out. Perhaps they're getting married. What happens then? I think of a a couple of brothers that, um, that bought a house together and then one of them met uh, the love of his life and decided, hey, I want to move out uh, and be with my wife alone and uh, I want my equity. I want you to buy me out of my equity and the house. Well, the brother that was still single and didn't have a wife to, to move out with, he, he didn't have the dough. So that, that created, a, created a lot of money, uh, problems in, in trying to trying to deal with that situation. They had to sell the house and, and then the, um, the other brother had to downsize and go buy a, buy a condo. He couldn't afford a house. Um, this is really important. Write up an agreement amongst yourselves to provide clarity in case someone forgets. It's, it's easy to forget something. You don't need to get a lawyer involved, but write something up, put it in writing on, on your, the nature of your agreement. Number nine, of course, pray and ask God for his wisdom and his specific directions. Um, as to whether or not you should enter into a shared accommodation agreement with a particular person. This is a scripture, Jeremiah 33, 3, that I claim so often, so many times, when I'm trying to make a decision about something, or even in cases where I'm trying to, you know, give counsel to somebody, biblical counsel, or I'm trying to give a counsel to a client or whatever, or it could be something on a ministry basis, or it can be almost anything. And I will say, Lord, I'll claim what God said, God said, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. It is so useful to ask God to reveal to you things about your potential housemate that you may not know. That could cause you some concern to back away from um, sharing accommodation with them. Um, I mean, we're not trying to look for the negative or the dirt, nothing like that, but just so you understand going in what all you're going to have to do with, deal with. Purchase a home if you can afford it and rent out part of it to generate income. You can do this on your own if you, if you can afford it or you can do it perhaps with another person. And um, maybe the two single people buy a house together and they rent out the basement. Help generate some income in order to uh, pay the rent and get it paid off faster. Consider living with your parents for a season of time if that's practical. Um, so those are um, some of the ones I had. Let me just um, pull this out of the way here. And I'm going to look at the... Um, you can, you can start thinking about this next question. Is it okay to share accommodation with a non-believer? But I'm going to look at, uh, there's a bunch of new messages here. Yeah, I agree. I mean, joint bank account for the house expenses only if the other party has a good credit rating. If the other per party has a bad credit rating, you probably shouldn't share accommodation with them. You probably shouldn't sign a mortgage with them or sign a lease. Um, and so that's something you could do. You could actually, I don't have that on my list. See, this has been, been raised here by Alexandra. Thank you. Um, share, agree to share each other your credit rating. And if someone's got a really bad credit rating, if it was me, I would, I would seriously consider not sharing accommodation with them. Okay, so Canada Homestream International was extra income. 
Okay, I'm, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not even sure what that is. So thank you for that. I know I've heard of the, what's it called, Air, Airbnb. Some people do that to get extra income. And uh, that can work, although there you got a bit of a risk. You got people coming into your house, you don't even know them. Yeah, stick with the budget. I agree, that's, that's an important point. Okay, okay, okay. So for Penny, this uh, having all these other people in their, in their house was good for her because she's very much an extrovert. Not everybody is. And so if someone's an introvert, um, that doesn't mean you can't enter into a shared accommodation agreement. Maybe you enter into it with another introvert, someone who's not going to be having uh, two friends, three friends over every day. So um, also consider health needs as you get older if you want to travel. Okay. Um, you don't know someone's habits till you spend time with them. I agree. I agree. Maybe, maybe there's, I think someone's suggestion here. Travel with somebody, if you're thinking of doing some accommodation with them, travel with them for a few days and, and see what they're like to be around. Okay, well, Ashley, that's, that's good. Ashley's saying she needed this. She was asking uh, God for a plan because she's got a sibling who's uh, talking to her about this very subject of sharing accommodation. So, so you've got a, a list of items here to uh, consider, Ashley, and also talk to your sibling about. Yeah, and, and, but don't substitute. We can give a list of things to do, but no substitute for prayer and asking God to reveal to you anything that you need to know. Okay, so um, is it okay to share accommodation with a non-believer? Okay, so um, please explain your answer and give a reference to scriptures. So uh, someone said, no, you, uh, you don't want to be unequally yoked. Another one uh, said they've done it twice and it's so stressful. Um, okay. They have a different life view. You can't sing or pray loudly. Oh, that's probably true. Uh, I'm not sure about this question. Okay. Um, be careful of Second Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to talk about that in a minute, Paul. Good comment. Uh, Tracy applied for geared to income rent, and God provided a condo at a great price. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, you, know, you get on one of those list, lists for those, um, those government-subsidized places, it, it can, you can really get tremendous deals on that. The problem is often there can be a waiting list that's extremely long. Okay, so there's some comments here about the unequally yoked thing and whether 2 Corinthians 6 applies, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And there's a different, different uh, opinions here, and I, I can see that, and I understand that. And, yeah, and I can see there's different views on that, whether you should share a place with a, a believer, whether you should do it with a non-believer, or should you just stick with believers. Yeah, and there can, there can, can be some cases. Uh, I'm going to dig into the scripture in a minute, in 2 Corinthians 4, um, 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 14 to 16. But these are good answers. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Arlene's comment, it depends on who the non-believer is. I mean, there are some non-believers who do have good morals and good values, you know, so uh, it, it could work out with them. Okay, the Airbnb, I didn't know this, Stephanie. You can actually dialogue with them before? Okay. You do have to be careful, especially if sharing accommodation with someone whose moral lifestyle is morally very... Okay, this is different. Ruth has asked a question. If you're a homeowner and you rent it to someone who's an un unbeliever, is not that the same as buying a house together? No, it's not, because you're the owner. You're not on the mortgage with that person. Uh, you're the owner, and if they don't pay your rent, subject to some of the restrictions now, at least in the province of Ontario, you can... Um, a victim if they don't pay their rent. So now, right now, that can take some time, because there's, um, I think there's, I think the non-eviction order is still in place, but um, but it, you know, it's I don't think you're yoked if, if if you have a tenant. Can Christians be at the same level of spirituality? Absolutely, that could. You get a spiritually mature Christian, you get a spiritually immature Christian who may be doing, still have one foot in the world, and and that could be a problem, no question. Okay, these are some really good answers. Thank you for those answers. Here we, here we go. This is what I had. And one, one of the, the questions I thought is, when I thought of Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, one fellow made reference to this. Let's look at this. The, the first thing to think about, does it apply when you share accommodation? Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. That's, so the key question becomes, are you yoked? For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what... Fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belli? What does a believer have in common with a non-believer? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate. I think the big question here, to me, there's no question. 2 Corinthians 6 applies in respect of a marriage. When you marry someone, 
you are yoked to them for life, biblically. Um, I know it doesn't always work out that way. We live in a fallen world. But you are yoked to them. It, it clearly applies there. But are you yoked when you, um, when, when, when you share accommodation, either rental accommodation or uh, buying a house? Do you think you're yoked under rental accommodation? What do you think about that? Okay, someone feels they, they don't think they're yoked with a, with a roommate. Okay, any other comments? You can definitely influence the other, but are you, are you York, yoked? Yoked being, remember the two oxen pulling the cart along, and they got a yoke between them, and if one decides to go this way and the other decides to go that way, it doesn't work. Um, are you tied in to a person to the point of being yoked, uh, to, similar to that analogy, when you rent a place? What do you think? Some people say yes. Some people say, well, yes, until the lease is up. You're yoked through the leasing agreement, okay. To, to some extent, yep, for the term of the lease. Yoke means covenant, doesn't it? Uh, good question. Certainly in a marriage it means covenant. Um, you're not yoked? Okay, so a lot of different opinions here, and I appreciate, I appreciate these. Um, these are a good comment. I think it depends on the nature of the arrangement. Uh, if it's a short-term rental, a rental agreement that you can get out of quite easily, then you're probably not unequally yoked. In other words, you're not yoked. I think if you can get out of it fairly easily, I don't think you're yoked. But if it's a long-term rental agreement, or if you purchase a house, a house or a condo especially, then I think you are yoked. I'd say especially with the purchase of a, of a house or a condo, you're yoked. You're both signed on the lease agreement. You're both registered on title for a, a piece of real estate. and. The only practical way to own real estate, and believe me, I'm a, I'm a strong believer that everyone should try to own their own home, their own condo or whatever, duplex, whatever they can afford, uh, long term if they can. It provides stability for you, stability for your future family if, if uh, God gives you a spouse and you get married. Or, uh, it just, if you get a nasty landlord, they can't kick you out. Or if you get a landlord that's decided they want to move in, they can't kick you out. It provides a lot of stability, and generally speaking, they go up in value over time, although there can, can be exceptions. Um, the early 80s, the early 90s, 2008, 2009, there were significant drops in the price of real estate, uh, certainly in, in Canada and the GTA area. So I'm a believer that, that if you can, so in my humble opinion, and, and this is, there's no clear answer to this, I think you are yoked if you buy a place together. If you're in a rental agreement, if, if you can get out of it fairly easily, you're probably not unequally yoked. Uh, probably not. I don't think so. Now, what's, uh, what's a long-term rental agreement? Now, if it's a five-year rental agreement, I think that, that's definitely long-term. If it's three-year, that's pretty long-term. Um, most rental agreements are one-year. Now you're really in the gray area. Um, if you get in and share an accommodation with someone um, that's not a believer for one year in a rental agreement, are you yoked? One could argue you're yoked for that year. Uh, on the other hand, you could put into the agreement, you could write into the agreement that, hey, landlord, if my partner doesn't, uh, you know, my, my housemate doesn't, doesn't pay their rent, I, I want the freedom to be able to leave with 30 days notice or 60 days notice. You, you, could, you could do things like that, or you simply have a one-year lease and understand you're, you're tied in for one year. But if it doesn't work out, you definitely go get another place. So you're not yoked long term, but there, there is an argument that you're yoked in a sense for the short term. Um, I think the key is can you get out of it fairly quickly? I mean, the other choice is just enter into a six year, six month rental agreement, make, make it shorter. So um, no simple answer here, but to, and each person has to pray. I think the, the quality of character of the person is so important. I think it's critical, uh, even Christian or non Christian. Um, I think, I, I do think a, a Christian, I think generally speaking, a Christian should probably not buy a house or a condo or whatever with a, with a non-believer. Um, that would certainly be my advice. Now, if someone has, I'm not saying you've done something terribly wrong, but I think we're just looking at, at some biblical guidelines. Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. Okay, if you're renting a room, most rooms are rented on a month-to-month -month basis, and you're in a, in a house where maybe there's three or four or five other people and you're sharing uh, the kitchen and the bathrooms and all this stuff, you're just renting a room, and it's going month to month, I don't think you're yoked uh, because you, you can live, leave within a month. You can, you can even leave sooner. I mean, 
if you get into a place, you're there for two weeks and it's just awful, they're having parties and they're smoking dope and all kinds of wild things are going on, um, you can probably leave within two weeks. Yeah, you may get stung for two weeks of uh, rent, but it's not a big deal. Yeah, I agree with this. It is very hard for a single person with a single income to currently buy a home. No question about it. That's why uh, there may be some merit in partnering up with a, uh, a friend of, of, you know, that's, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about the worldly type of partner. I'm just talking, you know, enter and be a co-owner with a friend or a sibling or somebody you know and trust and, and own the place together. Um, okay, there could be the same issues, Carmen, in respect to buying a condo versus renting one. I could, but the, the purchase of a piece of real estate is a much stronger yoking. For example, I remember um, a, a fellow, he, he bought a place with a, with a friend of his, and it, it wasn't working out. And so he wanted to sell and get his equity out and, and go do something else, but his friend didn't want to do that. His friend, no, I like it here. His friend was the guy with the parties and the, the noise and the alcohol and all that. You know, his friend, his friend didn't want to do that, so he refused to sell his, his interest. And so if you got two people, co-owners on a house, whether it's in joint tenants or tenants in common, doesn't matter, um, it's almost impossible for them to sell their interest. Like, you know, um, you know, so you can sort of get stuck with someone for a long time if you're a joint or if you're an owner, uh, whether it be tenants in common or joint, joint tenants, when you're an owner with someone else, you can be stuck with them for a long, long time. You know, I mean, nobody's questioning the, the real estate market in Toronto, Ottawa, most, uh, most of Canada, even the small towns now. I got clients in small towns where they say real estate's increased by 50 to 75% since the summer of 2020. It's just amazing. The real estate has just gone through the roof. We got an inflation problem, and the other reason it took it up was the Bank of Canada lowered the interest rate significantly in the spring of 2020 in response to uh, COVID-19 with the hope of trying to keep the economy going. Yeah, what's a, what's a non-believer? I mean, what's a Christian? Go uh, to Jesus said, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. To me, a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, they may be Catholic, they may be Protestant, but the most important thing is they have a relationship with Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. That's the most important thing. And there are some Catholic, this lady is, you know, there's certainly Catholics that know Christ as Savior and Lord that have a personal relationship and there's lots of Protestants too. I think, and even your denomination, that's all secondary. It depends where that person's at spiritually and then also in their spiritual walk. Where are they spiritually in terms of spiritual maturity? Yeah, people can move an area more affordable, move out of, out of the, the city, but uh, sometimes you can't get a job there. But uh, even it's just amazing that outside the city, the real estate's gotten so, um, it's gotten so expensive. So, um, well, thanks for those comments. Let me go on there. Um, having said that, I say there's no substitute for each individual praying and discerning what God wants them to do. Ephesians 5.17 says, Be careful, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Bottom line, pray and ask God for his wisdom and direction, and I know he'll give it to you. Besides um, accommodation, are there other expenses that could be shared? And I'm running a bit behind, so I'm going to go through these quickly. Yes, two or more people could share the, the, the cost of one automobile. It's going to reduce the fixed cost per person, such as insurance and the capital cost of the car, uh, and sharing the car loan payment, and if there is one, they could purchase food together in bulk, so there can be some other things they could share. Um, and that's it. So I'm going to ask uh, Rebecca... Young to provide her testimony of how God has enabled her by learning, learning God's Word and applying it on finances for quite a number of years and how God's enabled her to, um, to manage money God's way and experience God's peace in the area of finances. Okay, you look great, Rebecca. Okay, go ahead. So I wrote it out because I need to gather my thoughts. All right. So I grew up in a house that really didn't talk about finances. Uh, I found that stressful because even though my parents didn't talk about it, I could tell that money was tight because they would fight and yell around a lot. Um, by the time I left for university, I had decided that that is not what I wanted. I did not want to accumulate debt as they had. And also um, in the youth group at my church, I had learned about the you know, needs versus wants. And so when I went away to university, I tried to apply that to the decisions that I made. Is this something that I need or just something that I really want? 
Um, what I didn't realize then was how much the Bible had to say about finances. The first time I heard about this was when uh, Tom came to lead a study at my church in Toronto many, many years ago. Um, I was fairly newly married at that time. So that would have been probably early 2000s, very early 2000s. Um, but I attended the class by myself because my husband was still completing his studies. I would share with him what I was learning and would discuss it with him. Uh, it opened my eyes to how different the world and God view finances and how God would like us to steward the money he has given us. After all, everything belongs to him. And that was a new concept to me. Uh, what we learned then informed our decisions moving forward. We both tended to be savers by nature. And after learning God's principles, we paid off our school debts as quickly as possible and avoided taking on any more debt. We were able to save a down payment for our condo and made sure that we could afford it within our budget. We did not keep as detailed a budget as Tom has, but knew where our money was being spent and what our income was and never spent more than that. If we put anything on a credit card, we made sure that it would be paid off right away. It wasn't long before we were able to start saving for our future as well. God was also able to use what we had learned to help my parents when they faced financial difficulty due to the debt that they had accumulated. Uh, we could help them apply God's principles so that they could get out of that debt. Following God's principles for many years gave me a good starting point for when I became single again. I had assets and money to start with rather than debt. The first thing I did was a detailed budget to figure out what I could afford. I really wanted to be a good steward so last winter, I did Tom's uh, advanced study called Discerning God's Will and Managing Money, which reminded me again of how important knowing God's principles are in managing money well. I also had to learn how to do some things that I didn't have to before. My priority is to give back to God every month, and it has become such a joy. I love supporting the work that he is doing. God has been so good over the years and has provided many times, whether it's a job, money, furniture, or friends. God's faithfulness is astounding. I have been through tough times, but he has always been there, and I am so grateful that I don't have to figure out everything on my own. I took this course as a refresher and to get the singles perspective. I love the way Tom always points back to the scriptures because that is our source. Although I've known God's principles and have applied them, this time I am memorizing more of God's word so that I can share it with others and remember it myself. I also try to seek God more in my decisions, but this is a work in progress. It's so easy to move ahead instead of waiting and listening. I want to encourage you to manage God's money. Sorry, I want to encourage you to manage your money God's way. His way leads to blessings and peace, which is much better than debt and stress. So thanks, guys. <laughs> so I don't know if I don't know if there are any questions or if we're ready to move on, but that's all I have to say. Rebecca, thanks a lot. That was excellent. I love your final statement there. Um, following God's way results in blessing, blessings and peace. And uh, if I remembered it correctly, and uh, well, you go the world's way, it results in debt and stress. So that's that's excellent. Thank you. The next thing I'm going to do is um, the the first, the most important assignment this week is to for you to um, go through the Copeland budgeting system. Um, if you haven't already, you can go to our website. You can download it. It's, uh, it's free, there's 30 minutes of instructional video that's free. And now I'm gonna give an example of a um, single person who is spending a little more than they're making. This is an example of a single person um, who's doing what most single person would do. She, this individual has about a thousand bucks in a month, 10,000 in their tax-free savings account. They got a house that's worth $600,000, although they only paid about 200 of it, 20, 204, uh, 20 years ago, but you're going to see what's going to happen in a minute. They have started their retirement fund at $40,000, but their financial situation, as soon as I get a total on all their liabilities, I can pretty well figure out what's happened. They got 20000 on credit cards. They've been running a balance for quite a few years. They got a personal loan, 30000 They got a personal line of credit on their home because their house, they paid 20000 for it 20 years ago. It's worth 600 today, but they've got a personal line of credit against their home, so they've used the equity in their home to finance a lifestyle they couldn't, couldn't uh, afford. And I would guess that this individual has probably been overspending for at least 10 years, maybe 15 or 20, 
And what's happened is, as they overspent, the credit cards ran up. At first, they got the personal line of credit to pay off the credit cards, thinking they solved their problem. But then they continued to use the credit cards, spending more money than they could, and run up the balance again. And then next time around, they, they, they didn't get the, or couldn't get the line of credit. They've got some personal loans, maybe from their parents or a sibling or something like that, in order to pay off the line of credit. And now they've run up the credit cards again. This is so, so common we find when we sit down with people and just get a snapshot of this is what we call just a list of their liabilities. Uh, it, it, I can pretty well tell what's happened, and 99% of the time, that's what's happened. Now, if you go to form number two, this individual makes $4,000 a month after, um, after tax, okay? And um, form number three, they've, they've completed it. Let me just click on form number three. And you can see that they are setting, they have factored in some of the non-monthly expenses, but not all of them. And things like they're not saving for an auto replacement, so they're going to have a car loan all their life. They're not investing regularly in their RSP. And uh, you can see this is their non-monthly expenses. And if you go to form number five, this sort of tells the story. This is the big picture story where basically um, they used to give 10% to the Lord's work. They don't anymore because they've accumulated a lot of debt. They got a mortgage. They got property taxes, utilities. You add it all up. They're spending $2,000 a month on housing. They spend $600 a month on food. And they, um, bottom line, if you look at all the expenses, they eat out quite often. They got lots of friends. They have the member of a gym, they like doing vacations, and uh, they spend a fair bit on miscellaneous. And you can see they got a deficit of $856 a month. This is the most common thing that we see when, uh, when I'm sitting down and, and we're giving somebody some, some, um, some financial advice, where they're spending a little bit more than they're making and they're accumulating debt. So here's some uh, questions. I'm going to make you their... Um, their financial advisor, and uh, what would you suggest that they do in order to get their financial house in order? What, what, what should they do to get their financial house? A number of thank yous there, Rebecca. Yeah, you did a great job. So what should this, um, this individual do? It could be a male or a female. Stop eating out. Absolutely, I agree. I'd, I'd say let's, let's lower that to even 25 bucks a month. They're just going to be able to eat out once. That's it. Less entertainment. I, I agree. They could... Um, uh, like, for example, the vacation. Uh, if we go back to form number three, they're spending, you know, uh, let's go vacation, $1,800 a year on a vacation. She should probably do or he should do the staycation and just spend 300 bucks a year and so lower that. Anything else here on, um, on the non-monthly expenses while we're on this form? Maybe the house maintenance, they could do more of that themselves, especially if it's a guy. Let's say they can get that down to 600 uh, a year. <clears throat> Property taxes can't do anything about that if they stay where they are. Auto repairs and maintenance, maybe they could just drive less. You know, just, just try to try to make a point of driving less and cut that down by a few hundred dollars a year. Auto insurance is going to stay the same. Vacation we've cut down. Health care can cut down. Christmas gifts is something they could certainly cut down. Let's say they knock that down to a couple hundred dollars a year. And then um, let me just see the bottom here. The miscellaneous, that's the category that doesn't uh, you know, go anywhere. So um, anything else we got here? Reduce some expenses. Yeah, stop eating out. Okay, keep the house but lower the lifestyle. I agree. Stop sports membership. I'm going to remove that in a minute. Let's say on the miscellaneous, they control that better and make it 1200 bucks a year or $100 a month because that's the category that can, can actually, people can run up quite a bit. So someone suggested eliminate the gym. Yeah, I think they should just, just work out at home and go for a walk in the neighborhood. You know, you know, lower some of these things. If they, if they turn the lights off more often, uh, they can probably save some money there. On gas, they could probably save some money there as well if they cock the, cock the things. Water, they might save a bit. I don't think they'd save much there. Telephone, maybe they look for a better deal. Anybody thought of, um, you know, a better deal? Eating out, reduce clothing expense. Okay, we'll come to that. Eliminate the gym membership. Do the staycations. Okay, exercise at home. Yep. Lower spending, trip gifts, okay, reduce, okay. The other is the miscellaneous, it's sort of a catch-all. A number of people here suggested uh, she gives, let, let's say in faith, she just starts, starts to give. It's not a legalism, but say she increases it. Let's say she's not ready, or he's not ready to go to 400 bucks a month, but they're ready to go partway there, let's say halfway there to 250 a month. Now that's, that's a start. Let's say, um, you know, telephone, they can probably get a better deal if you look around, maybe save 50 bucks a month there. Uh, food, they could probably, a single person, how much uh, is a reasonable 
of trim food clothing expense. Yeah, I mean, they could actually literally stop buying clothes probably for a season of time, but let's assume they only have to spend 25 bucks a month, 300 bucks a year. What else you got here? I'm just looking at your answers. Um, lower the telephone, we did that. Better phone package, cut cable for streaming. Excellent, I agree. Uh, get rid of the house line and just have cell phones. I agree, maybe we can even lower this a little further. I agree, you don't often don't need um, Phone is 100 enough, but can you get a phone and uh, a cell phone and uh, an internet connection for 100 bucks a month? I don't know. Somebody tell me. Go for a third-party phone, less clues. 300 bucks on food. Uh, okay. Can a single person spend 300 bucks on food? Maybe they can. Uh, I guess. I guess that's possible if they're if they're very careful and how they spend their money. Somebody suggested 400 for food. 600 for you know. You know, maybe the, the food is a, is a bit of a tough one. Let's say we go somewhere in between, 350. Some are saying 300, some are saying 400. Grow your own, yeah, only if you've got a, a garden you can grow it in. Um, remember, they were going to cut back on, on how much they traveled, so they put through, um, let's reduce that to $200 a month. Okay, so we, we've lowered a lot of things here and eliminated a lot of things. And look what's happened. We've gone from a deficit, which was about 800 bucks per month, to a surplus of 255. So the good news is this individual is at least getting ahead now. They got some surplus cash. They can start paying down their mortgage, and um, and and that kind of stuff. Now the one thing we didn't talk about, and we'll talk a little bit more later. What about earning some additional income? Many times people can, and so maybe she could take on a part-time job or do something from home or whatever, and earn a couple, couple hundred bucks a month. Or maybe this individual, if they have an apartment, maybe they, they could share it with someone, rent a room out or something. But let's assume they can even get another $300 a month. Not, not a lot of money, but just 300 bucks a month. And so if you go back to form number five, let me just, let me just flip back here. There we are. You can see that this, this individual has gone from a deficit of 800 a month to $550 a month with 10 minutes of advice from you folks as financial advisors. And now they can get ahead. I mean, to me, this number here is so important. It has to be a surplus. Uh, so many people, it's a deficit. Most people, it's in the red. Uh, by far, most people are selling, spending a little more than they're making and accumulating debt. You've got to get to a point where that number is a surplus so you can start getting ahead. You can start paying down debt and saving for future needs. If you get more income, yeah, you may pay more in taxes, but I'm assuming the $300 is net of tax. Maybe they had to, maybe they had to make $400 gross or something. Okay, so that just gives you an idea, and it just shows you that even with some input from you folks, in a matter of 10 minutes, we've got this person. Now, sometimes you can't do it by eliminating a lot of the discretionary expenses. Sometimes what happens is you've got to change this thing and downsize the house or downsize the apartment, whatever, or go and do shared accommodation. Uh, or if this individual owns a house, I mean, this, if, if uh, this individual would, would to rent out some rooms, they can get... I mean, 300 bucks is cheap for a room. Um, I know a guy that's um, in, in the Richmond Hill area, and anyhow, he's paying about 600 bucks a month just for a room. And he gets to use the kitchen and the bathroom uh, with some other tenants, but um, you, you, can, you can generally get, um, yeah, it's um, 700 bucks is north, I believe it. Okay, so, um, but I'm, I'm assuming maybe it's a, a student or something, but I mean, if you even get, let's say you can get 500 bucks a month, um, if you look at it, it just makes it look even better that this individual now have a surplus, a cash of $755 a month. Okay, so um, anyhow, that's a big picture overview. Any, um, any, question, um, any questions on that one? So we've talked about um, the single person uh, spending more. That's an overview of the forms. Okay, um, I'm going to just talk about Bill and Barb here. It's in your book on page 88. They made their first attempt at their budget, and they're somewhat bewildered. Their budget shows a surplus. I don't have time to put it on the screen. It's in the book on page 88. Um, but they still notice their credit card balances are going up and their debt's increasing. Uh, what happened was this. This couple, when they did their first budget, they factored in their common monthly expenses, their mortgage payment, their utilities, um, that kind of stuff. But they didn't factor in the non-monthly expenses, which are on form number three, which I showed you in a minute. The things that come up, once a year, it could be automobile insurance, could be house insurance, could be vacation, could be automobile repairs. Uh, it, it can be all kinds of different expenses can come up once a year or maybe 
several times a year, like property taxes in some places you pay four times a year that doesn't come out every month. And they didn't factor that into their budget. And once they factored it in, they actually had a deficit. They didn't have a surplus. I've seen that lots of times. Lots of times we ask people to complete the Copeland budgeting system. They complete it, and it shows that it's a nice size surplus on form number five. But it's not. Once they complete legitimately and do form number, number three with the non-monthly expenses, it generally ends up showing there's a deficit, and it explains why they've been accumulating debt over the last several years. So I'm going to just push on on this one. I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time on it because you can look at it, and that's, that's the key. I want to get into this, um, this thing for Paul, and before I do, let me just um, see, is there any um, non-monthly regular expenses on page 100? Uh, E3, yeah, that's probably what it is. Um, the the non-monthly expenses are those expenses that do not come up every month, okay? That's what they are. Uh, they just they just don't they do not come up every month. And and um, yeah, it is it is on page one hundred of the participants workbook, and it's called Schedule E hyphen three. That is correct. Some people are asking questions here about giving. I'll deal with that in a couple of sessions. We'll go into that in more detail, okay? So there's the three questions. Let me deal with what I had. And I imagine you folks got most of them. What should Paul do? Paul needs to develop and implement a budget, Luke 14, 28 to 30, to ensure that he's spending less than he earns and, um, and, and so he has a surplus to pay down debt. Um, this would include tracking his expenses, which he doesn't, he has no idea where his money going. So he knows where his money going. You can see the references to scripture there. Paul needs to learn to be content. That's a big one. Paul, the apostle Paul, said, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I, I've learned the secret of being content in any and in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Paul learned by developing a close relationship with Jesus Christ and focusing on things of eternal value, which takes your mindset off the temporal things, he learned how to be content. Uh, this, this, I'm talking to the Apostle Paul there, learned how to do it. This guy named Paul no relation to the Apostle Paul. In our case study here, who spends uh, excessively, he needs to learn to be content. He also needs to develop a close relationship with the Lord so he can discern God's will uh, regarding his spending. He needs to obtain godly counsel before making any financial decisions. Of course, he's not uh, getting godly counsel from this banker. Most bankers do not give biblical financial advice. Their training is basically to lend as much money as you can because the more money they lend out, uh, the more money they make. So. Luke 16, 10, do you think Paul, uh, uh, Paul earning more income will solve his financial problems? And the answer is absolutely not. Paul's not been trustworthy in managing his present level of income, and therefore Paul will not be trustworthy in handling level, a higher level of income. And I got down here. I've seen this over and over again in the ministry and in business with people I counsel that as the income goes up, people's borrowing capacity goes up. The more you make, the more the bank will lend you. And this is a guy that could get further and further into debt, and he could keep going, doing this for quite a while and just end up accumulating a horrendous amount of debt. And down the road at some point, he's going to run into a problem. So in the parable of the talents emphasizes this because what was one of the key emphasis in the parable of the talents? That's where the master in charge entrusted five talents to one servant, two to another servant, one to a third. After a long time, maybe a lifetime, the, the master came back and made the servants accountable, not for 10%, but 100% of what they had. And the, the, the one with five talents that gained five more, the one that had two talents gained two more, both heard, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Well, the one with one talent that made no effort to invest his master's money, made no effort to use the talents and abilities God gave him to invest the master's money, didn't do anything, the, the master took that away from him. So there's even a risk if Paul keeps doing this, God may look down and say, hey, I've given you a high income. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to someone else. You're not a very good servant, uh, steward of my money. So um, now here's the next item. What are some ideas for single people to save money? What, any, any ideas? And then we're going to talk about money, ways to earn money. But just throw out some ideas. I won't take a lot. But here we, we can come up with hundreds of them uh, very quickly, I have found, when you, when you get going on it. Rent out the garage? I hadn't thought of that. That's a good idea, um, especially if that's practical. Uh, save on groceries, you can uh, fellowship with others, have a potluck once in a while, okay. Barter on services with someone, yep, yep. Um, you can probably do, that, that's probably easier to do now online. 
Use a jar method for, for managing your money, okay, for different things. Um, buy food in bulk, cook many meals at once and freeze the meals for the week, good idea. Have money automatically go to your savings account whenever you get paid, that's, that's a good idea, yep. Declutter, unused things, sell them or trade them, yeah, you can sell them online or you can uh, have a garage sale. Um, switch from purchasing with credit cards to cash, okay. Uh, buy a secondhand car, that's true, instead of buying a new one. Uh, just having a simple lifestyle, I agree. Uh, freeze your account so that you can't readily access it, okay. <laughs> Limit your access somehow. Any other comments? Uh, these, these are good ones. Spend less and live be all okay. Yeah, just buy the basics for food. Shop at drift stores. Buy clothes at secondhand stores, okay. Invite friends for a meal instead of going to a restaurant. Rent out extra rooms, yeah, you can do that. Some good answers here as I'm just scrolling through them. Ask God how to spend the money in life, I agree. Designate days to do shopping and not impulsive shopping, I agree. You gotta be, if you're an impulsive shopper, you gotta be really careful. Maybe, maybe just stay away from the shopping mall. Only go to the grocery store when you have to. That's true, don't upgrade your mobile. Lots of people are upgrading their mobile phones more often than needed. Do small jobs online, get some extra money. House sit for others. Okay, I mean, if you buy a property, if it's a um, zone for business, maybe do some work there on, on rezoning your property, or unless maybe you've got it, so okay. Um, rent out your house and go camping for the summer? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, if, if you can handle uh, living outside like that for the whole summer. Uh, make use of coupons, yep, do the sales. Some people like to travel so they can go and sit or plan or sit at a friend's place and they can travel elsewhere, okay. Okay, cut back on uh, vacations. I, th I, I like the staycation idea. Just go for a drive to a nice area. I mean, where we live here in Toronto, there's Muskoka, there's um, Halliburton, there's, there's a lot of nice places you can drive to in a couple hours. So, um, okay, these are some good ones. Now, what about some ideas to earn more income? Any ideas there to earn more income? Fix your own car, absolutely, if you know how to do that. Um, yeah, any ideas to earn more income? Have a small business on the side, okay. We talked about it earlier, you could rent out a room or rent out part of your house, work part-time. I picked up a job with Instacart. I'm not sure what Inst Instacart is. Rent out a parking space, sure, if you have it. Babysit, yeah. Self-learning, okay. Ask your employer for a raise, certainly you could do that. Get into stocks if you know what you're doing. Yeah, you got to be, be careful there. Now, uh, and you also have to have the surplus money. Uber, Uber, okay, okay. I know what Uber is. Uh, get into, yeah, if you got the surplus money. Oh, Instacart, getting paid to do other people's shopping, okay. Uh, have an RSP, RSPs are good, yep. Save tax and um, take the refund and apply it against your mortgage or other debt. Sell stuff on Kijiji, yeah, there's lots of stuff. People often have a lot of stuff. Ask God for a high paying job. I mean, that's, you could ask God job for a better job. I've seen the Lord do that many times, especially as people start to, um, you know, as, as people start to manage money God's way. I see God's hands moving. There's often these small miracles. Provide child care. Single moms, I mean, one of the best things you can do, you say you're a single mom with one child, and if you're staying at home and hoping to live on, uh, you know, spousal support and child support, why don't you, um, Bring in a child or two into your house and um, be on the receiving end of childcare instead on the paying jet. Yeah, you could cook. I mean, some people have a talent for cooking, no question. Make some job on the sides. Offer your services free for or to learn to trade. Yeah. If you have collectibles, yeah, sell them for a profit. And certainly today, selling online, it makes a lot of this um, fostering. Okay, there's, there's lots of ideas here. Well, thank you for those ideas. Um, they're all good. You, you can go on almost for, um, you can sell... Some things you can sell on eBay. Yard work, many, um, yeah, certainly doing. Um, now I'm gonna demonstrate a balanced budget for Rachel. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, okay, so this is a budget of a, a single woman, it could be a single man, who's doing things right. And I just wanna see what it looks like. She has $5,000 in her savings checking account. She's got $25,000 as investment, so she's, say her tax-free savings account, she's got $30,000, um, more than six months, probably seven months worth of expenses saved in case she's ever out of work or that kind of stuff. That's biblical. In the house of the wise, there is a storage of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. She's a, she has a principal residence. She did, did buy it some years ago. 
at a much lower price, let's say 300000 but it's worth five hundred a day. Praise God for that. She's got an RSP of $35,000. She's got a mortgage on her house of 100000 Now, this lady's been managing money for God's way for at least 10 years. She's been paying off debt. She's got all her debt paid off. She just has her mortgage. She's been working on that, and she keeps working on it. I think it's going to be gone in about 10 years. So she's, in, um, she's doing things right. I, as soon as we get a list of their assets and liabilities, I can tell pretty fast if someone's been managing money well over the past several years. Most of the time, what we see is people have lots of credit card debt, personal loans, lines of credit, car loans, etc., etc. Now we go on to form number two. This lady makes about $4,500 a month after tax. On form number three, she has uh, done it right. She's accounted for everything. Uh, house maintenance, she's put something in there. Property taxes, 3000 a month. You notice how it divides by 12, so it calculates a monthly amount, which is what goes into form number five. House insurance is 600 a year, so she's saving $50 a month to cover that. Auto replacement, very few people save to replace their automobiles. She figures her car will last another 60 months or five years, and she's anticipating buying a good used car for $12,000, so she's setting aside $200 a month so she can buy a good used car and she doesn't have to go into debt. Auto repairs and maintenance is running her about $1,200 a year, so she sets aside $100 a month. Auto insurance is $1,100 a year, so she's setting aside $92 a month, etc. You can see all the calculations. She's planning for a vacation next year at $900. And so she's setting aside money for that every month. And she's allowed for everything. So she's setting aside $1,042 a month out of her $4,500 a month for these non-monthly expenses. And I won't go into details, but if you look at form number four on the Copeland budgeting system, it actually shows you, once you put in the numbers on form three, it actually allocates the amounts out here. And now the only thing we did was we split it in half because she gets paid twice a month. So out of the... Um, the thousand and forty-two dollars. She's going to put five twenty-one um, at the beginning of the month and five twenty-one at the the middle of the month into a savings account. And then she's got uh, how that money is planned to be saved. So she's and then if she needs money for something like say for house maintenance, she can take the hundred dollars out of her savings account and pop it over into her checking account and pay that bill. Now this lady Rachel, like anyone else, she's got two hundred forty-two dollars still in her savings account. She may think, well, can she afford to buy something extra for 150 bucks? Yeah, but no, it's all, it's all accounted for. And that's one of the purposes of form number sign three is to make it so that you can account for these future um, expenses that are coming up so you don't suddenly have a, a few hundred bucks or several hundred bucks in your savings account and think that, think that you can spend it. So this, this is her savings account in addition to the 5,000 we showed on form number five, which is sort of more of her backup uh, emergency account. Now, if you go to form number five, let me uh, have a look at this. She gives 10% to the Lord. That's the guideline. Her mortgage is 926 a month and as indicated below, it'll be paid off in 10 years. Uh, she'll be debt free. Property taxes is accounted for. That came from form number three. She, her hydro bill averages 150 a month. Gas is 100 a month. She's put in all the expenses. She's counted for everything. She's even allowed $500 per month for food because she also buys quite a, quite a bit of health food. Now that's more than what most single people need, but she's got a cushion there which is good. Her auto, she is saving to replace her automobile. She spends 150 bucks a month on gas and oil. Maintenance, she's allowed 100 bucks for, so that's 542. She has no debt whatsoever. Um, she, she only spends 50 bucks a month eating out. She's got $75 a month allocated each month for vacation. And investments, she's doing some smart things. She's investing money in her RSP for retirement. And let's say she has one child. She's investing some money in the retirement savings plan for her child. Healthcare, uh, she's got money there, insurance, she's got money. And her total expenses come to $4,298, and her, her revenue is $4,500. That came from form number two. So she's got a surplus of $202 a month. So this lady is doing it right. This, this helps you to see what it looks like for a single um, a mom who has a balanced budget. That sort of covers uh, that off. I'm just keeping an eye on the time there. That gives you a, an overview of what's, what's happening there. Um, and... Um, just are there any any um, any final questions? So I'll just uh, ask the participants if there's any um, questions so far. Um, how do you get my book? Just go to the website copelandfinancialministries.org and you can order it there. Um, no problem. What's the average earning income single person should make per month net? That's a good question. There's no simple answer to that. This example I gave, she's earning forty-five hundred dollars a month net, which is probably um, 
you know, that's, that's, that's probably a little above average. I mean, 4,500 a month round numbers would probably be about 6,000 a month. That's 72,000 a year. She's probably, she's making a little more than average. What's the average person make? Uh, I'm going to guess about, about 50, uh, give or take. It really depends. And so they're going to have after tax, maybe more like 3,500 a month, something less, give or take. Um, you basically have to work it within uh, whatever whatever you you have. I mean, this lady has a house and she's she's paid a fair bit of it off, and she's been managing money God's way for quite some time. So um, the key is not so much what the average income is. To me, the key is um, what are you making? What income is God providing you? And so what can you afford? Credit card debt, pay off first, or start a fund for car replacement? Good question. I'd say pay off the credit card debt because it's so expensive. 18 to 25% is so expensive. Yeah, I wouldn't say, real estate agents will say, um, don't uh, pay your mortgage off. Um, there's benefits in, um, there's more benefits in paying off, not pouring your money. Let's put it this way. My, my view is, pay off your credit cards first. They're the most expensive by far. Pay off any other loans that uh, have a significant interest charge to, you, to them. But also, once you have the positive cash flow and you continue to do it, Pay down your pay down the mortgage in your on your house. When you noticed last year when I last week when I showed the difference between saver versus a, a borrower, um, and I showed the difference that if someone can just free up four or five hundred dollars a month to pay down on their mortgage, they can save fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars in interest over the long term, and cut ten years off a thirty year mortgage. So um, you are better to there's there's no there's no downside to having a house that's debt free when you go to sell. As a matter of fact, it makes it a bit simpler for the lawyers on the transaction because there's no uh, mortgage to be discharged. So I demonstrated Rachel's budget. Uh, for those that plan to get married one day, I'd encourage you to review Dave and Debbie's budget. It's a good example for a couple. It's located in the participants workbook at the end of session six on page 98. Generally, the principles of budgeting for a single person are the same as a couple, except generally the single person has one income. But remember that a single person should have lesser expenses and of course, You've only got one spender. Believe me, if you're married and you've got a spouse that squanders money, that's a whole lot more stressful in the financial area than if you're single and you only have one income. Because if you've got a spouse that squanders money, they can spend it a lot faster than you can save it. I just thought I'd mention before I, I finish up here, there are some opportunities to serve in this ministry if you're interested. You can provide a brief testimony, about 10 minutes, like um, Rebecca did tonight. She did so well, and Randy Ziegelhagen did before. And the key we like to focus on, how God has enabled you to manage money in a biblical fashion and the resulting benefits. You can also provide biblically-based financial advice to an individual or couple, including budget coaching. And you can lead a small group using my in-depth Bible study. Most of the groups are done on Zoom. Now, these number two and three, we don't let people do that until they've been through Financial Management God's Way this series in depth and they've, they've got a good handle on what the Bible says on finances and they have their finances, it doesn't have to be perfect, but either have them in really good shape or they're, they're in the process of getting them in really good shape. Uh, nobody's perfect. And actually from time to time we, we need people that can spot check. Uh, my financial moments are right across the country and in some northern United States and just be good. Uh, you know, for example, I don't think we have anybody in BC. Um, I don't think we have, uh, we have somebody in Alberta to check one of them, but uh, if, if you're in a city outside the greater Toronto area and you'd um, be willing, and you've, you've heard the financial moments on TV or radio, be willing to spot check them, we'd appreciate it. We, uh, these TV and radio stations sometimes make mistakes and I don't know about them unless one of my spot checkers uh, lets me know. Okay, let me, uh, let me pray and if you have any specific questions for me, you can send them to my email address. Father, we thank you that your word says so much on finances. I thank you, Lord, for this group that they give uh, good answers and ask good questions. I thank you that they participate and that uh, they seem to be getting it. And I thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I know, as it says in Isaiah 55, 11, so is your word, Lord, that goes out from your mouth. It will not return to you empty, but will accomplish what you desire, Lord, and fulfill the purpose of for which you sent it. Your word is powerful and it's truth. Um, uh, it's, your word is inspired. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, I pray that through your word and your spirit, you would touch the hearts of everyone listening and that you would help them to change the way they think about money and material things into a manner that's consistent with you and your word, Lord, and that they would in turn manage the money you've entrusted to them according to your principles and your specific will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.